Dark matter is not even what we should be calling it. Because that implies that it's matter. It implies we know something about it that we actually don't. So a more precise labeling for it would be dark gravity. The James Webb Space Telescope has been changing our understanding of the universe with phenomenal discoveries since its launch in 2021. These discoveries, like huge black holes, extraordinarily big ancient galaxies, and unique planetary systems, have sparked discussions over basic elements of the cosmos. Just moments ago, the JWST made yet another shocking revelation, something so enormous that it threatens the fundamental foundations of the universe. What is this latest discovery from JWST? Will this discovery force us to reconsider the underlying rules that govern our universe? Join us as we explore the latest discovery of the James Webb Space Telescope and how it could destroy the universe. One of the greatest accomplishments of the last century in the field of cosmology is the creation of a standard model of cosmology, which sheds light on the universe's history and how it came to be as it is. The cosmos is made up of dark energy, dark matter, normal matter, neutrinos and photons. Let's break them down. Dark energy is a mysterious factor that forces the cosmos to expand at an increasing rate. It covers around 68% of the cosmos. Dark matter is a form that does not interact with light, but may be identified due to its gravitational effects on other things. It comprises around 27% of the cosmos. Normal matter is visible and interactable. It accounts for less than 5% of the cosmos. On the other hand, neutrinos are small particles produced by nuclear processes in stars and other astronomical objects. They are extremely difficult to detect because of their weak interaction with other matters. They comprise a relatively tiny portion of the cosmos. Photons are particles of light. They are in charge of transmitting electromagnetic power, which allows us to view our surroundings. The hot Big Bang, an event that created the universe as we know it, occurred 13.8 billion years ago. Cosmic inflation then introduced density flaws that led to the creation of the cosmos. Despite all of the observational data supporting this claim, it may not be entirely accurate. We have to make sure that our observations of the cosmos remain compatible with this model every time we make a new observation of it. With the recent addition of the James Webb Space Telescope to astronomers' instruments, concerns have been raised regarding the model's accuracy. According to the most recent fad among armchair physicists, online observations question the standard model. The whole truth is still unknown despite the astounding assertions made. As things are now, we have to map out how we anticipate how they will happen in the universe. This theory has been very effective. It is frequently referred to as the Lambda Cold Dark Matter Model, the inflationary hot Big Bang, or the standard model of cosmology. The Lambda CDM is a mathematical model of the Big Bang theory with three major components a cosmological constant denoted by lambda associated with dark energy, the postulated cold dark matter, and ordinary matter. It is frequently called the standard model of Big Bang cosmology because it is the simplest model that provides a reasonably good account of the existence and structure of the cosmic microwave background. It also accounts for the large-scale structure in the distribution of galaxies. In addition, the Lambda CDM explains the observed abundances of hydrogen, including deuterium, helium, and lithium, and the accelerating expansion of the universe observed in the light from distant galaxies and supernovae. It also explains features found in the Big Bang's leftover glow, the cosmic microwave background, CMB. The theoretical framework also predicts that the galaxies we observe will be inherently smaller, bluer, less developed and less rich in heavy elements as we gaze farther and farther back in time. At some point beyond where we've been able to look, we should cease to see stars or galaxies of any type as we'll reach the universe's dark ages. 
but this is only a general overview of what takes place. We need to quantitatively determine not just what happens, but also when and how much it occurs in order to compare theory to data. Our best quantitative projections still have a lot of uncertainty, even with the well-established initial conditions and the common rules of physics. This uncertainty is influenced by the cosmic inflation theory and the variations observed in the cosmic microwave background. Our knowledge starts with the hot Big Bang, when everything in the cosmos was nearly uniform at the beginning. The seeds of structure, density flaws, were imprinted on top of that near-uniform backdrop, resulting in under-densities and over-densities of around one part in 30,000 level. These defects, which were nearly but not quite identical on all cosmic sizes, were around 3% bigger on universe scales than galaxy scales. They first developed gravitationally, but they also resisted pressure from interactions and radiation. These include photons, forming a pattern of peaks and valleys in the relative, over or under denseness of different locations on a range of cosmic sizes. Around 380,000 years after the hot Big Bang, the cosmos produced neutral atoms. They expanded, cooled, and gravitated according to the principles of general relativity, as long as these density flaws were modest in comparison to the universe's average density. It is simple and easy to calculate their growth, but as they get bigger, a number of factors all become relevant, making the issue of how big and how fast they grow highly assumption dependent. When significant volumes of gas gather in dense areas, it effectively cools. High density zones interact in overlapping areas as overdense regions form across the expanding cosmos, with some small scale regions overlaid on larger scale overdensities. Some overdense zones are found near other overdense regions. These regions interact with one another to influence structural growth. As normal matter gathers in the centers of these dense zones, it slows, collides, and heats up. How does the feedback from radiated heat impact the development rate of these areas, which include both normal and dark matter? How does this affect normal and dark matter that does not become stars? And what consequences does this have for future generations of stars and the formation of these early cosmic structures? The solutions to all of these issues are unknown. They are theoretical in nature and are determined by the details we include and exclude from our models and simulations. Sometimes we wonder if we are using the right models to detect halos, which indicate individual overdensity in space. Or we are mistakenly perceiving interdependent halos as independent entities or vice versa. We are investigating the precise modeling of early stars, including their initial mass functions and death processes. They may be heavier and more likely to collapse directly into black holes than previously imagined. Furthermore, the question of whether stars are required for the formation of black holes or if crossing gas streams may generate the seeds of supermassive black holes, which may have masses millions of times greater than our sun instantaneously is also being researched. It's very clear that the first known objects, stars, black holes and star clusters formed no later than 150 million years after the Big Bang and maybe as early as 50 to 100 million years after the Great Bang. However, these should be rather rare instances. Now, for the first time, thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope's exceptional capabilities, we're beginning to detect and characterize unexpected old objects discovered in the early phases of our cosmic history. In other words, the telescope is currently changing scientists' perceptions of the universe's early billion years. One collection of fascinating artifacts stood out among the several presentations. Some astronomers referred to them as concealed tiny monsters, while others described them as small red spots. But regardless of their name, the evidence was clear. When James Webb looks at young galaxies, which appear as red dots in the darkness, he sees a remarkable amount of cyclones churning in their centers. Dr. Anna Christina Eilers, an astronomer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology said, there seems to be an abundant population of sources we didn't know about, 
which we didn't anticipate finding at all. Astronomers have been both excited and puzzled by the recent influx of observations of cosmic smudges. Everybody is talking about these little red dots, said Xiao Hui Fan, a University of Arizona researcher who has spent his whole career looking for faraway objects in the early universe. The most obvious explanation for the tornado-like galaxies is that massive black holes weighing millions of suns are crushing the gas clouds into frenzies. This conclusion is predicted since James Webb was designed in part to discover these ancient objects, the ancestors of billion sun black holes that appeared in the cosmic record early. Scientists aim to learn more about the origin of the earliest massive black holes and maybe even determine which of two competitive theories best explains their formation. Did they grow extraordinarily quickly, or were they just large from birth? However, the results are shocking since few astronomers predicted James Webb to discover so many young, hungry black holes, and surveys are revealing them by the dozen. While seeking to solve the former mystery, scientists discovered a number of massive black holes that might rewrite accepted theories about stars, galaxies, and more. Marta Volontari, an astronomer specializing in black holes at the Paris Institute of Astrophysics, and her colleagues are now dealing with an inflow of massive black holes in the early universe. She went on to say, if they are real, they completely change the picture. Many suggestions have recently been proposed to answer the challenge, but they all fall into three categories. Perhaps we've got the seed size and timing correct, but the growth is off and black hole masses expand quicker than we realize. Perhaps we have the seed size completely incorrect and bigger cosmic structures are possible, driven by processes like structure building or a significantly higher beginning mass for the biggest stars. Or perhaps our perception is wrong and the universe began with black holes that formed before any stars could, a set of primordial black holes. Regarding the first one, it is true that black holes can expand faster than the Eddington limit due to non-spherical accretion. However, such accumulation is difficult to maintain over time. Even if we allow for bursts of faster than expected growth, it is still difficult to explain how so many supermassive black holes, about 200, all experienced what should have been unusual and fleeting conditions for such long periods. The third option starts as a rather unappealing offer. If we wanted to produce a spike in the mass spectrum at a specific value, we would have to conjecture some brand new, unexplored sciences. To form a primordial black hole, you must have an area of space that is denser than 168% of the cosmic average in the early stages of the expanding universe. However, as previously stated, about 100% of all early areas in space are between 99.98% and 10.02% of the average density. This scenario is impossible unless you create a new means to have ultra-large magnitude fluctuation on a very small and specialized cosmic scale and nothing else. However, there is hope that this perceived problem will turn out to be the outcome of regular, routine, everyday astrophysics. Sure, a seed black hole of a few hundred solar masses formed 100 million years after the Big Bang will not suffice. However, if we could create seed black holes that were 100 times more massive in that early era, we would have a way out. If the universe could create a seed black hole with a few tens of thousands of solar masses barely 100 million years after the Big Bang, the tension would be resolved. The composition of the cosmos prior to the formation of the first stars gives a strong indication that this is possible. Today's stars are formed by the collapse of gas clouds, mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, but also including traces of heavier elements such as oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, neon, silicon, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, and iron. It is mostly those heavy elements that allow gas clouds to cool and compress resulting in stars with an average mass 40% that of the Sun. While humans may be able to create a few very massive stars with masses of 50, 100 or even 200 solar masses or more, 
only a small percentage of them will be large enough to explode supernova and leave a black hole remnant. However, without the presence of those heavy components, star formation would have had to proceed differently from the start. The most effective approach to cool clouds of gas that try to gravitationally contract remains very ineffective. With an efficient cooling mechanism in place, molecular clouds must become more massive in order to collapse, and the stars that emerge are expected to be 25 times more massive than today's stars on average. We identify several stars with comparable masses, as well as the earliest stars created from ultra-massive molecular clouds, which possibly had many stars with 1,000 solar masses. It is likely that multiple seed black holes might emerge and then merge, resulting in a beginning black hole with enough mass to allow us to find a solution. However, even this situation, which brings us closer to the desired conclusion, is tough. How can we get all of these seed black holes to fuse rapidly enough without gravitational interactions causing an ejection or mutual interactions clearing the galactic center of the necessary material for formation? Something else must come into play if we are to go from hand waving to well-understood physics and astrophysics. That is exactly where the current study led by Daniel Whalen of the University of Portsmouth comes in. Cosmologists can monitor where large, massive collections of matter can gather in one particular location. They do this by simulating how structure forms in the early universe, including dark matter, early star clusters, and streams of normal matter, and watching how proto-galaxies and star clusters merge together amidst the backdrop of the cosmos. This approach proved a few years ago that cold, ultra-massive streams of gas would clash at the nexus points of this proto-cosmic web. This allows gas to ascend to high densities in tiny volumes holding up to 100,000 solar masses in one area. This recent research demonstrated that these cold gas flows cause a large amount of turbulence, in contrast to earlier studies that suggested the presence of UV backdrops, supersonic streaming movements, or some sort of atomic and molecular cooling. This turbulence stops star formation from taking place completely until a critical mass is attained. When the dense area reaches that mass threshold, it collapses abruptly, resulting in the production of individual objects, stars or black holes, with masses of up to 40,000 solar masses. A team has demonstrated for the first time using known non-exotic physics that seed black holes of the required mass may have been produced just little more than 100 million years after the Big Bang. This theoretical advancement could not come at a better moment, as James Webb's activities are outperforming all expectations. One of its unmatched responsibilities will be to explore the first black holes in their galaxy surroundings, giving insight into how they arose and expanded. This scenario, in which cold gas streams clash to build monster-sized stars, capable of becoming black holes with masses of tens of thousands of solar masses, will shortly face its final test. As Whalen himself pointed out, the only primordial clouds capable of forming a quasar shortly after cosmic dawn, when the universe's earliest stars emerged, also produced huge seeds. This simple, elegant discovery explains not just the formation of the first quasars, but also their demographics, their numbers in the early days. The first supermassive black holes were merely the result of structure generation in cold dark matter cosmologies, which are the offspring of the cosmic web. Astronomers have spent nearly two decades trying to figure out how these supermassive black holes located in the universe's most distant quasars evolved to be so large and so rapidly. This new finding strongly supports a unique gas-driven scenario that does not need any new physics. We'll be able to learn how the universe's most enormous early things grew up in the next few years, if not months. Two powerful telescopes, James Webb and Hubble, have recently teamed to produce the most colorful image of the cosmos. They have come together to investigate Max 0416, a massive galactic cluster. The resulting panchromatic picture mixes visible and infrared light to provide one of the most complete views of the cosmos ever captured. 
MAX 0416, located around 4.3 billion light years from Earth, is a pair of colliding galaxy clusters that may merge to produce an even larger cluster. The image exposes lots of information that can be captured by combining the abilities of two space telescopes. It contains a large number of galaxies outside the cluster. This cluster was the first in a series of images of the cosmos from a Hubble program known as the Frontier Fields, which began in 2014. Hubble pioneered the hunt for some of the weakest and youngest galaxies ever discovered. Webb's infrared perspective adds greatly to this in-depth investigation by peering deeper into the early cosmos. We are building on Hubble's legacy by pushing to greater distances and fainter objects, said Rogier Windhorst of Arizona State University, lead investigator of the PEARLS program, which carried out the Webb observations. While the latest Webb findings support this aesthetic viewpoint, they were collected for a specific scientific reason. The researchers merged their three sets of observations, which were obtained weeks apart, with a fourth epoch from the Canadian NIRIS Unbiased Cluster Survey Study Team. The purpose was to look for objects whose brightness changed over time, known as transients. They found 14 such transients within the area of vision. Twelve of those transients were found in three galaxies that have been greatly enhanced by gravitational lensing and they are most likely individual stars or multiple star systems that have been temporarily enlarged. The remaining two transients are in magnified background galaxies and are likely to be supernovae. We're calling MAX 0416 the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster, both because it's so colourful and because of these flickering lights we find within it. We can see transients everywhere, said Hao Jingyan of the University of Missouri in Columbia, Lad author of one paper describing the scientific results. Finding so many transients with observations spanning such a short time period means that astronomers might discover many more transients in this cluster and others like it via regular web monitoring. Are we ready to delve deeper into the mysteries of our universe and explore the implications of such extraordinary findings? Thank you for watching another episode of Voyager. While you are still here, click on the video on your screen to see more mind-blowing videos like this one.